Um, welcome everybody uh, to this wonderful Green Energy Series. Thank you for giving us an hour of your Saturday this March. Um, today's webinar will be talking about the evolving utility customer relationship. So we are Solar Oregon. Solar Oregon is a nonprofit that has been helping homeowners and communities uh, members navigate and accelerate the development of solar energy in Oregon and Southwest Washington. And we've been doing this for the last 36 years. We do this via education, outreach, and advocacy work. Um, and we do this through our solar plus storage webinars, solar tours, solarized campaigns, and peer-to-peer -peer education events. And speaking of solar plus storage uh, webinars, we have another uh, offering of this solar plus storage webinar uh, coming soon, Wednesday, March 8th at 2 p.m. While Solar Oregon is a lean and mean and efficient organization, we do depend on the support of the community to help fund events and operations. I encourage you to donate or become a Solar Oregon member via this link. And feel free to use the Q&A to uh, uh, enter questions. We uh, do have somebody who is monitoring and will uh, we'll address the questions uh, at the end of the presentation. And my name is Edward Louis. I am a building energy efficiency research engineer at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I'm also on the board of Solar Oregon. And outside of work, one of my main hobbies is to finish building an off-grid uh, zero energy, all electric, tiny house. And just to let you know, um, the views in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the position of Pacific Northwest National Lab, the U.S. Department of Energy, or Solar Oregon. I've made a best effort to uh, convey the facts information accurately. However, I do encourage you to uh, do your own research before uh, making any sort of investment decisions. And so for this presentation, uh, we'll cover the traditional utility customer relationship. And then also we'll look at all the technologies that have become available in the last you know, 10, 15 years um, that have really changed the utility customer relationship. And as well as some of the means and methods at which the utility has responded to this changing relationship and how that future uh, could shape up. So traditionally, uh, electric utility relationship has been very simple. Customers purchase power and the electric utility works with generators to provide power. Um, and because the customers uh, only consume power, they do not have solar on the roof, they do not have batteries, uh, they do not have electric vehicles. Their loads were very predictable. Um, so uh, the utilities had the graphs of how the loads look depending on weather conditions. Um, and they were able to look at past history for the demand to predict what the forecasted weather will uh, shape up for the electric loads coming in the next few days. And so using that information, they were able to plan um, what electric generating units to you know, supply that energy with. However, all of this is changing. One of the main changes is customers now have the ability to purchase solar panels. And so as a result, they're able to generate some of the energy they use on site. And so this energy that is generated on site means less kilowatt hours sold, but at the, but Despite having less kilowatt hours sold, the electric utility still needs to maintain reliability because all the customers of solar, they expect that on a cloudy day or at night or whatever, that the lights stay on. And so um, the electric utilities provide that stability. Um, meanwhile, uh, the electric utility is able to sell less kilowatt hours. So this is you know, a, 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 a problem um, that the electric utilities need to adapt to. And now, um, as the price of batteries have become 
uh, has dropped rapidly, um, nearly as fast as solar panels have dropped in price. Now customers have batteries on top of having solar or having batteries with no solar. But what these batteries can do is um, they're able to create a lot more flexibility on when the customer uses energy. Um, now it's possible to have a home or building use no energy on certain hours, even at night, and on even in if the battery is big enough, even certain days. And so this is further able to, you know, have flexibility. Um, but at the same time, oftentimes people who own these batteries have the expectation that, okay, well, I have batteries, it covers most nights of energy use, but on a very cold night, perhaps the battery isn't big enough to cover my nighttime energy usage. And so they still expect the lights to stay on. And so this is another thing that, you know, the, the electric utilities now have to uh, manage is, okay, well, if somebody has solar plus storage that covers most days energy and most nights energy, but there's still 20 days out of the year, 30 days out of the year, when there's certain hours or certain days when the battery is not enough and the solar is not enough and they, they still want energy from the grid. So how does a utility support you know, homes with this um, situation where they're only buying power for a very small number of hours or certain very small number of days in the, in the year? So that's a good question. Electric vehicles is also changing uh, how things work. Um, as I said before, electricity use was very predictable, but with electric vehicles, the electricity use is much less predictable. Um, and so if you, use, if you come home after work around 5, 6, 7 p.m. and you're charging after work at home, uh, that is a particularly problematic time uh, to be charging because with, the, with having rooftop solar and utility solar and all this solar uh, on the grid, what happens is that the the solar is offsetting the electricity use during the afternoon hours. And so from an electric utility perspective, they're seeing a lot smaller electrical demand that they need to supply to because some of that electrical uh, like energy usage is being offset by the solar on site. However, Around 5, 6 p.m., what happens is that the sun is now swung to an angle where the solar panels stop producing. Um, and so those homes and buildings that originally had energy uh, demands that were offset by the solar are now coming back onto the grid and showing up on the electric utilities uh, perspective as the loads that they need to meet and supply for. But if you, on top of that period, you start also wanting your electric vehicles to be charged, then that peak that happens around 5, 6, 7, 8 p.m. gets even higher. Um, and the electric utilities need to find a way to supply that energy. And oftentimes, in order to find a way to supply that energy, um, they have to resort to very expensive uh, generating resources. However, um, as this graph shows, if you are able to charge at work, um, that's a very good thing because that's often when uh, the electric loads from the electric utilities perspective is very low because a lot of those building loads have been offset by solar panels. Um, but of course, you know, not every workplace has charging. Um, and that's a policy thing that, you know, we can solve. We can have workplace places offer more electric vehicle charging. Um, so anyways, that, that's kind of the story of electric vehicles. And we also have um, more and more smart appliances that are what are what's called demand response capable. And so what this means is that these smart devices have a, a through either Wi-Fi or an FM radio receiver, 
they're able to receive a signal that is sent by the electric utility uh, to tell these devices to do something. And this do something part um, often means reducing energy usage. Or the other command that can be said is start using energy now. Uh, those are usually the two, demand, uh, the, the, the two commands that um, uh, are sent to these devices. And so when you're sent, when the utility can send a signal to the thermostat or the water heater to say, hey, limit energy use or suspend energy use for the next 15 minutes or the next half an hour, it will respond by doing that. Um, of course, they have a button on the display for the user to you know, override that um, if there's comfort issues, but this, this happens automatically. Um, and so the, the reason why the electric, electric utilities want this capability is because energy demand and energy supply is a balancing act. And this energy balancing act has to happen at the millisecond level because that's that's the way energy is. There, there's there, it have, has to be balanced in real time, and so a kilowatt hour of less de, of reduced demand is the same as having to increase supply by the same kilowatt hour to meet that demand. And so. If you're able to remove, re reduce demand for that second or that minute, then at that second or that minute, you don't need to generate that same kilowatt hour to supply. So there, that's why demand response is um, a very interesting tool that is now available to electric utilities, and they're very interested in this technology. And so having all these capabilities at the and resources at the customer side has lots of implications. One is, uh, for the most part, it's resulted in loads that are harder to predict, harder to manage daily load shapes. Um, and as, as you can see, the, the, the load shape here is, as I described before, a result of having solar on, on site during those hours around noon when the solar when the sun is shining it you know on those panels it's able to offset all the electric um, energy demands on site and so from the electric utility perspective they're seeing a huge reduction in um, energy demand that they need a supply for but when the sun swings it across the sky and then in the evening um, then all those loads reappear and on top of that oftentimes uh, people, want to, you know, charge their electric vehicle and other, you know, um, turn up, turn on their thermostat, turn up their thermostat or turn down the thermostat, depending on the summer or winter, and it causes an even higher peak. Um, and these shapes are really hard to manage. Um, and, and then, as I said, with batteries, um, you can, it results in, it can it result in even higher peaks in, in lower valleys, because um, during the modest temperature days, uh, those batteries can meet the load throughout the night. And so then for homes with solar and batteries, they are essentially off grid during those those days. And so they have zero demand uh, that the electric utility needs to respond to. But then on the days when they reappear, which is the coldest or the hottest days of the year, then uh, <laughs> that, that, that will result in higher peaks and lower valleys. And so these, these, all these effects result in a grid that is more difficult to maintain for reliability. And speaking of um, you know, the uh, ability for the electric utility to respond to these you know, peaks and valleys, these are the resources that an electric utility has access to in terms of different generating resources. You know, there's hydro to choose from, there's nuclear, there's coal power plants, there are natural gas power plants, there's solar um, power that they can tap into, but they have very different flexibility. And so for the most part, most of these generating resources do not have that much flexibility. Like obviously with solar and wind, your flexibility is low because 
they only generate when they're in the sunny or they only generate when it's windy. Um, nuclear, you know, despite being a, a dispatchable resource, um, has very low uh, flexibility. Um, the uh, the nuclear the nuclear reaction generates a certain amount of heat uh, to 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 create steam, and uh, it's very it's quite slow to try to get that system to turn down the amount of heat it produces or to turn up the amount of heat it produces in order to generate more or less steam. It's a very gradual process. Um, and so if on a minute or an hour or day day to day level, you expect uh, a nuclear plant uh, generating unit to change its output, it, it's, it's very slow process. And so therefore it has very low flexibility. So out of all these different resources, the one that has the most flexibility is natural gas, um, but uh, and and as a result, you often hear in the news that you know the electric utilities are retiring uh, generating resources and then adopting natural gas generating resources, and the reason is because they that flexibility allows it to work better with wind and solar. Uh, that have very low flexibility. And so, um, but even natural gas generating resources, if they're only operating for 50% of the hours of the year, 25% of the hours of the year, um, because, you know, the, 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 the other resources are able to meet load, then that generating resource becomes more expensive because there's a capital cost to uh, installing this natural gas generating unit. There's cost to maintaining it. There's cost to keep people employed to, you know, sit at the controls. But if it's only operating for a smaller and smaller number of hours a year, then the, each kilowatt hour that generating unit generates is higher. And so what are ways that electric utilities can um, do to flatten the demand curve, because as I said, when you have these, you know, peaks and valleys, um, that's where you know you you have higher costs because um, you're not able to sell as much energy, uh, but yet you have to maintain resources to be able to supply for those peaks. And so, how can we flatten? How can an electric utility flatten that this load shape? One of the ways that they can do that is uh, with something called time of use or time of day rates, because you know, they, what they see is on a day-to-day, -day, when are these peaks and really high peaks occurring? Well, they appear usually Monday through Friday. And the highest peak usually happens in the evening around like that 5 to 9 p.m. mark. And so with time of use rates, what they can do is significantly raise the cost of energy during that period. And so those who have the ability to adjust their energy demands can not use energy during the, the peak time periods and then shift them to off-peak events. And so this is an economic uh, incentive to um, encourage users to adjust their energy usage patterns away from that peak. So then by having people shift their energy usage away from this peak, then the peak gets um, not as high, so a, a lower peak, and a lower peak means that you know they have they can afford to buy one less natural gas power plant, for example, um, which has millions of dollars in savings. And so this is an economic incentive, but it's dependent on people who can make adjustments to their lifestyle uh, to be able to you know use energy away from the peak. And so then the question is, you know what loads can be controlled uh, to reduce energy during those peaks uh, with minimal to no impact to occupant satisfaction. Um, most of the time, the, the, the loads that are the most controllable are space conditioning loads, storage water heater loads, and perhaps refrigeration loads. Um, if you turn up or down your thermostat by one or two degrees, Generally, most people are not going to instantly become dissatisfied. Um, 
it, storage water heaters can have with 40, 50, 80 gallons of storage, um, you can still get comfortable showers and hot water at the taps, uh, even if there's no active heating of that water because the tank is really well insulated. Um, and so you can have 15 minute, 30 minutes, sometimes even like multiple hours uh, where the space conditioning is you know, turned up a few degrees or turned down a few degrees and that the water heating is um, suspended for you know, 15 to even several hours and nobody will be the wiser. You know, you'll, you'll still feel comfortable. You'll still have hot water. Um, refrigeration is another one that like, um, if, uh, unless you open your refrigerator a whole bunch and the interior compartment of the refrigerator changes temperature by a whole lot because you've opened the doors a lot, um, refrigerators are very ins well insulated boxes. And so, um, they're able, it's, it's possible to suspend um, energy use from the refrigeration uh, for 15, half an hour, even hours, and have the temperature of the refrigerator not move by more than one or two degrees. Um, so, you know, these are controllable uh, loads. Um, and then obviously the non-controllable loads is cooking, lights, and in-use plug loads. Uh, Certainly the electric utilities wouldn't want to dim your lights for you because you'll notice. Um, and then there are certain gray areas. Um, like uh, if you have a closed dryer that is running, um, is it possible to, you know, turn off the heating elements for, you know, 15 minutes while the drum is still spinning? And so therefore, you know, it's still drying and removing moisture, but just at a slower rate because the heating elements are not running um, for that 15 minute period. Um, but this is a gray area because, you know, for some people, you know, they're trying to get their clothes dried by a certain time and they don't want their clothes to take longer than that because they're trying to go out, you know, and <laughs> and their, their outfit that they're trying to wear uh, is in the dryer right now. Um, same thing with electric vehicle charging. Um, it, it is possible to plug it in and then have the electric utility, you know, uh, sh uh, shift that time for when it actually starts charging uh, to a later time. Uh, and for some, that doesn't matter because they don't really need that car charged until next morning. And there's all night to, you know, shift loads around. Um, but if you have an evening event you're trying to get to, um, perhaps, you know, you want that uh, vehicle charged at by a certain time. And so there's that gray area. Um, and currently, the electric utility has, you know, some ways to, um, besides, for example, that time of use, uh, to try to incentivize people to adjust their energy usage behavior to uh, shift away from peak energy times to times when energy is less congested. Um, another way to do that is uh, through um, text messages and emails uh, through, um, in, this, in this case, Portland General Electric calls this peak time rebates. Other utilities might call it something different. But essentially, what the, these programs do is they send you emails and text messages telling you at what hours for ne the next day uh, they would like you to save energy and shift your energy use to us you know away from those hours and if you're able to successfully do that they give you a credit and that credit can range from you know cents to over a dollar a kilowatt hour and a dollar a kilowatt hour is a lot because you know um most uh, electric utilities portland general electric pacific power uh as examples a the normal rate for a kilowatt hour is around 13 cents. And so if the electric utility is paying a dollar, you know, that's eight times as much, you know, <laughs> as your uh, regular um, uh, value cost of your kilowatt hour. And this is a, uh, a credit that you get at the end of the month. Um, and they have some brochures to um, help, help you understand how you can save energy during that peak time event. Um, some of the things that they encourage you to do is to uh, run your washing machine and dryer and dishwasher uh, at the at a time period 
outside of that peak time event uh, time window. Um, you can, you know, uh, shift when you do your cooking, uh, if possible, outside of that time window. Uh, you can adjust your thermostat so that um, it is it, or it heats or cools less during that peak time event. Um, and so, as I said, like this, the reason why they do do it this way is because the electric utility is unsure where, whether you can, you know, make these shifts or not, but they don't require you to make the shift. But what they're saying is if you can successfully make the shift, then they'll pay you, you know, a, a, a high rate uh, for that kilowatt hour. And so then, you know, the, as a result, the electric utility doesn't need to answer the question of what is controllable or not controllable. Like, you know, right now in this table, you know, I'm saying like, usually, you know, people want their, when they're cooking, they don't want somebody to turn off their cooking or turn off their oven when they're cooking. But if you're able to manually through your own behavioral decisions, you just not cook during those hours, then, hey, then you don't need to answer the question of being able to turn on and off the circuit for cooking. Um, as I said, another way that electric utilities can um, manage the loads is through an automated signal called demand response. These are Wi-Fi or FM radio signals that get sent to devices that can receive them. Um, and there's a picture of the module that can be plugged into a demand response capable water heater um, on the left-hand side. Over here, you got the, uh, the more common smart thermostats, Nest and Ecobee, able to receive those signals. On the far right, you have a, a module that plugs in between a electric dryer and the plug, and this module can receive the signals. And as I said, like either suspend drying altogether or more often than not, the solution is actually to turn off the heating elements, but maintain the, the spinning of the drum so that you're still removing some moisture, uh, but you know, saving uh, the kilowatt hours for the heating element for that you know, 10, 15 minute period. Another uh, utility response is to adjust the um, the payback or the uh, uh, the the credit that you get for um, solar panels for, uh, on your on your property, um, California recently um, made a decision to adjust the credit that new solar panels. This is, does not affect existing customers that have already have solar panels on their roof, but this is new installations of new solar panels. Um, they they have significantly reduced the uh, the the credit that the customer will receive for the kilowatt hours that they generate from that uh, solar array uh, moving forward. I, the the uh, the the transition period is April of this year, um, and so <laughs> I can imagine right now in California there's a huge uh, demand to buy and install solar panels before this cutoff period, <laughs> um, but. Uh, the, the, the reason for uh, this reduced um, credit is to encourage people to find ways to perhaps install, for, for example, solar plus storage. So then they're not sending those kilowatt hours to the grid at between the hours of noon and 4 p.m. Instead, you know, because they're not very, very valuable sending it to the grid. Um, therefore, it encourages people to, you know, install salt, uh, storage. So then they store the energy, excess energy that the solar panels generate, uh, and then they're able to use it uh, on behind the meter, self-consumption. Um, and so then you get the full benefit of that kilowatt hour um, that you've generated from the solar panels. Um, Australia has a lot of sun. Um, so much sun that, you know, their electric grid also experiences those big dips in um, the electric demand during the uh, noon to 4 p.m. hours, and then that spike at 5 to 9 p.m., um, their solution for um, how to manage solar is not necessarily with an economic disincentive, but just a limit, just a hard limit for um, how many kilowatt you can send back to the grid uh, so that um, the, the grid doesn't receive so many kilowatts of 
uh, solar rooftop solar that um, it causes a significant dip in the um, load profile. So these are some of the electric utility responses to the technologies that are now available on the customer side. Um, so in the in the future, there are there, we will likely see more of some you know all of these different uh, efforts, but uh, perhaps um, there will be more of a shift to try to automate you know these um, events, and we've already touched based on a little bit on the um, what 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 is called direct utility control model. So like um, the all of these demand response uh, capable uh, uh, appliances and devices um, are actually operating off of something called uh, CTA 2045 or IEEE 2030.5. These are standards, kind of like 5G and Wi-Fi. Uh, these are standard protocols that allow the electric utility to you know, click a mouse, press a button, and then send out that signal to then have these devices respond uh, by reducing uh, energy use in a certain way. Um, so that's one way to do it. Um, there's another uh, protocol called Open ADR, and this model operates a little bit differently. Um, it is a inform and motivate model, um, and uh, we'll talk about how that is different in the the next in the future slide, but uh, direct utility control model um, is pretty easy to implement. Like I said, it's uh, there. There's very uh, kind of set commands to send to get you know the thermostat, for example, to you know uh, turn up the thermostat or turn down the thermostat a certain number of degrees and have that last for a certain number of time period. Um, but uh, one of the problems with this these uh with this model of energy savings is that you cannot like you will be uncomfortable like you might get a cold shower or you'll be uncomfortable and then after by being uncomfortable do you realize that this event has occurred and certainly there's a button for you to press to override this but who in the world stands in front of their thermostat all day or stands in front of their water heater all day to you know, see whether an event like this is happening and then decide whether they want to override or not. Nobody does that. So like, you know, we go about our business and then, you know, when we get a cold shower, we start feeling uncomfortable. Then we go to the thermostat and perhaps override. Um, but uh, this model where like the electric utility presses a button and then it automatically, you know, these the thermostat or the water heater responds already. Um, and then what and the user you know, doesn't realize it until they are uncomfortable. This this model could be difficult to sell to the majority. Um, even if the current pilots for smart thermostats or pilots for uh, smart water heaters uh, are fairly successful with early adopters. Um, there's a there's the narrative of you know the, the displeasure for you know some utility or big brother. Uh, controlling my thermostat or controlling my water heater. Um, and so uh, some of these narratives uh, could really uh, affect the um, adopt adoption of these technologies by the uh, middle majority of, cons of the consumer base. So perhaps that's why, you know, the, the other model, uh, open ADR, uh, could be a better model and how open ADR works is um, it's inform and motivate. So what what this uh, what this model does is um, it, for example, will release price signals for the cost of energy for the different hours. So like similar to time of use, but except that it's not fixed Monday through Friday, certain time blocks. It's not fixed like you know the time of use rate. It's it's variable. It changes. Um, and so it will, for example, like release those uh, costs per kilowatt hour um, for the next day and for each hour. And then you, the customer, can decide how to program your, your equipment to respond. 
So you, for example, you know, you can program your water heater to say like, I will, the water heater will operate and use energy um, on its own whenever, you know, there's the water cools down and therefore it'll reheat that water um, and use energy just normally until the cost of energy reaches 15 cents a kilowatt hour. Above 15 cents a kilowatt hour, then I'm willing to have that water heater, you know, not reheat water unless the water heat, unless the water temperature falls to 105 degrees from 100, from the, from the, 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 the normal 120. You can start programming equipment to, you know, have these sort of decisions. Um, and the, the, so then as a result, then the, um, the system will then like, uh, how how it, how it will operate is um, it will know kind of through experience what these different sites and how they're programmed. So like, you know, site, it'll know at site A, for example, that the water heater uh, will continue to use energy until, you know, it receives a price signal of, you know, 15 cents a kilowatt hour. And then afterwards, and it'll consider saving energy. Um, site B might have a different criteria you know, based on their, that customer's sensitivity. Um, and so this offer, offers, you know, more flexibility so that, you know, different users with different, you know, comfort sensitivities or preferences can, you know, program their equipment differently, um, but still, you know, get the energy savings when the price is high enough. Um, whereas like in the time of use model, then it's like, well, okay. Um, certainly, most you know, uh, uh, if for me personally, if if water, if 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 the cost of electricity is thirty two cents, you know, almost thirty three cents per kilowatt hour, dang right, you know, I'm gonna you know be okay with having my water heater, you know, have a top level temperature lower. Um, you know, maybe I'm okay with a lukewarm shower if 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 necessary. Um, through that five to nine p.m. period, because you know, geez, like thirty-three cents a kilowatt hour, that's pretty expensive. Um, but you know, other people might have a different preference, and so then, like, you can program the the equipment differently. And so, this certainly open ADR. One of the cons is that it requires a lot more decisions to be made when it comes to like um, interaction between the uh, each individual user site and the utility and also more programming and decisions for equipment setup. But one of the pros is um, it, it is an inform and motivate model. So then like it gives customer a lot more choice on how their equipment will respond versus this direct utility control model where, as I said, like um, the utility will press a button and then unless you're standing in front of your thermostat or your water heater, you won't notice that that's happening until you're possibly uncomfortable. Um, so this could be more acceptable. Um, but anyways, uh, the whether it be time of use or automated uh, demand response via either uh, the direct utility model or the inform and motivate model or text manual text messaging, you know, customers, all these methods, the goal is to flatten the load curve so that we're lowering peaks and, you know, increasing energy usage in the valleys so that um, the when renewables is available and when the loads are being demanded match up more. Um, and this is really important because if we actually want more renewables on the grid and we want lower cost of energy while maintaining reliability, we have to do this matching up of the loads when the renewables are available because otherwise, as I said, electric utilities will have to maintain very expensive um, natural gas power plants that are called peaker plants. Um, and um, they operate very for very few hours of the year. And while operating for very few hours of the year, they still have very high upfront cost and very high maintenance cost. And those costs will be transferred to ratepayers, customers. Um, which is not necessarily a great thing. And then of course, you know, with time of use or demand response, all of these things are great 
you know, if you have the financial means to buy the equipment to allow, for example, demand response to occur or to um, have the financial means could also mean a, a, a job flexibility to be able to, you know, uh, take showers and cook at different times to, you know, respond to that time of use rate. But what about customers who have a job that is not so flexible? or they don't have the financial means to buy a smart thermostat or a smart water heater that can do that automated you know, energy savings at the peak times. Electric utilities are regulated by public utility commissions. And these public utility commissions, what they do is they look at, okay, how do these ideas affect different customer classes or customer types, customers at different economic um, on, on the different areas of the economic spectrum. And they study you know, the effects uh, um, on these different customers and they study whether there's something called cross subsidization. Um, and what this means is, um, is exactly like you know, I, I was saying, for example, that time of use rates. Um, if a customer is not able to be flexible in when they use energy, for the same amount of energy, their utility bills will be higher because they're not able to be flexible to move their energy usage away from that, for example, that 5 to 9 p.m. period. Um, and so that is a negative uh, economic effect on those customers that are not flexible. And so, um, and oftentimes those customers are, you know, lower income customers. And so, you know, there, there's a, you know, equity versus equ um, equality issue going on. And so, therefore, to address these, likely there will probably always be a rate tariff um, that maintains, you know, steady uh, electric cost um, for rate payers who can't adapt to demand response or time of use or, uh, you know, uh, what's it called, flexible um, uh, energy cost and, and those things. And so I, I think that the, the future will uh, be that more customers, even the middle majority of the customers uh, will be amicable to um, working with the utility, working with solar and these, you know, uh, only available when the sun is shining, only available when the wind is blowing, uh, you know, these non-dispatchable renewables and, and, and be amicable to um, adjusting their loads um, to when to match when the sun is shining, to match when the wind is when the wind is blowing. Um, and also uh, be amicable to like adding the cost of storage to solar. Um, in order to make that happen and have devices that um, are able to, you know, turn turn up the thermostat, turn down the thermostat, you know, shift when uh, water heating occurs and stuff. Um, but with that, uh, we'll answer questions. Um, and I guess, like, perhaps one of the other concluding things is that the, the future is undecided on, you know, what products are the solution to matching up the loads uh, with demand. If, you, if, if, the, if the resounding vo voice of the customer base is we do not like you know, automated demand response, fine, we can remove that as one of the options. Uh, what other options you know, would you, are you amicable to um, as an alternative? I mean, certainly uh, the, 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 the answer of, I just want to use energy whenever I want, and I don't can't be bothered to you know uh, ha with having to purchase equipment that um, will be able to respond to the shifts. That's not exactly a great answer, but you know it is an acceptable answer if you know uh, to a certain small customer base. But if ninety nine percent of the customers um, you know want that answer, then we can't have that and have lots of renewables. Um, but you know the the. The, the folks who want renewables and a cleaner energy grid, um, if for that customer base with that opinion, if you do not like, you know, a certain product 
for you know demand response or a shifting energy use, it, we don't need every single one, um, but we do need you know uh, certain ones. And so yeah, with that, uh, well, so Edward, that's great. We do have a question uh, in the Q and A from Ole, and um, I can let I can I have to do it one by one, but I can turn on allow to talk from anybody that wants to just talk uh, sure. but can you can see the q a right edward i do i can see the q a uh is pg or doing variable rate power depending on time of day um i don't believe perhaps that is available to residential customers so um variable rate power um is another word for that is real-time energy pricing and real time is kind of a caveat, like, you know, real time is not down to the second or down to the minute. Uh, usually it's down to like the hour. Um, and um, that I don't believe PG is doing that yet. And um, but they are doing the opt in time of use. Right. So this time you of have use. To decide for yourself if that makes sense and if you want to play that game. Exactly. So like this is the current one of the options. Um, like when I look at it, this time of use period, me personally, 5 to 9 p.m. is a pretty long period of time. I mean, it's not a 15 minute window. It's not an hour window. So like that's quite a bit of a ask in my personal opinion and my work schedule uh, to to be able to span that. And the only the only way that I would personally participate in time of use rates of in this price tiering is if I purchased the battery, uh, re regardless of whether I had solar or not, I would purchase a battery that can charge during the off peak peak, peak hour and cover my loads between the mid peak and the on peak hours, so that I basically drop off the grid and not use energy during this period. But um, the only reason why I would do this is I would have to do some economic analysis to see whether like buying a few thousand dollars worth of batteries uh is worth it over the, like you know a five ten year period to um realize the savings of you know between 33 cents and seven and a half cents <laughs> that, that's the only way i would do it i mean i don't think i could manually like you know take showers at a different time and cook at a different time to be able to cover this work around this this time of use rate me that, that this is me personally yeah <laughs> So there's another great question about PV and EV charging and. Yeah, so, okay, yeah, power. we have a PV that generates half of our electricity and an electric vehicle, a Chevy Volt. We're interested in flattening the curve using storage of our car. We're currently only charged at night. How can we do more? Is bi-directional charging going to be available in Oregon soon? We are a um, PPL customer. so. Uh, Pacific Power and Light, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, yes, charging at night is um, a really good idea. It's especially a good idea if you participate in the time of use rate. But even if you don't participate in the time of use rate, um, this curve here is still happening, regardless on the grid. This is this curve is still happening on the grid, reg regardless of whether you choose a time of use rate or a you know a rate where the, the cost of energy doesn't change between you know midnight and midnight. Um, so it's it's still advantageous to charge at night to not charge during this five to nine p.m. period for your Chevy Bolt. Um, the the thing about the Chevy Bolt is I'm not sure whether it is capable of bidirectional charging. Um, understanding is not yet <laughs> and, and and it may it may be something that chevy needs to like release a firmware update um in order to enable that because i believe the chevy bolt does have a ccs plug or a combined charging system plug where it does have those two dc pins yeah um uh, for the plug uh so it is hardware wise capable of doing bi-directional charging but i don't know whether the software is allowing that and of course you would need a different charger because um how ccs dc um, bi-directional charging works is that it will enable 
the high voltage DC from the batteries to come back out of the vehicle. But in order to use that for the house or the grid, you still need to be able to invert, use an inverter to invert that high voltage DC to usable 120, 240 volts. And a standard electric vehicle charger has no capability of doing that. So it, it, you would need a different charger. And those chargers are just becoming available on the market today. I mean, the one that's in the news a lot now is the Ford F-150 pickup truck has huge battery pack and has that uh, vehicle to home capability. And I'm hoping that the excitement around that is going to motivate more EV makers to make that a uh, standard option. Because I think that is one of the most efficient ways financially <laughs> and just space-wise, you've already got the car uh, to be able to, to get storage for some of your uh, PV. Right. I mean, but at the same time, we still need some decision, you know, intelligent decision making. Like, you know, on, on a day when I'm not planning the drive or I'm planning to drive a very short distance, absolutely, you know, take as... I, I would be personally okay with you know the the uh, the electric vehicle to home taking a, a more than fifty percent of the energy out of the battery of the car. I'd be okay with that. Um, but if I'm planning to go to like the beach from Portland, uh, I don't want any a single kilowatt hour taken out of my electric vehicle. I want the whole full range in order to be able to you know make my trip possible. <laughs> so like you know there needs to be some sort of like you know decision making that goes on instead of like you know free reign uh to uh, uh I, I, access to the battery i recently heard another answer to the question how can we do more is if your your roof doesn't have uh enough you know capabilities with the you've sort of maxed out the photovoltaics that you can fit on your roof that makes sense you can also sign up for a community solar project, and that would be supporting another location, mm. putting up solar panels and putting that into the grid. And so that's another way to become, you know, sort of essentially net zero in, in a way. Right. And, and right now, there are some electric utility especially in australia that are doing the so, uh, utility solar plus a big like battery array um but uh you know like a lot of utility solar that has been done in in the past have been solar have not actually been done by the electric utility so what i mean by that is so in the traditional electric utility model these generating units whether they be utility scale solar or natural gas power plants or nuclear power plants, they are not always owned by the electric utility. So the, the way the, the, the electric grid works in the US is utilities can actually be just a, um, what's it called? A, 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 a conductor to coordinate uh, all these different independent generators um, to work together to meet their customers' electric loads. So um, because of this, you know, ability for independent generators to, you know, install, you know, a utility scale solar, um, what has happened is that th that, po that policy or that economic um, allowance uh, has allowed, has resulted in, you know, independent uh, investors to, you know, install a big solar, uh, utility grid, a, a, a sol utility scale solar array onto the grid and sell power to the electric utility to then the electric utility then coordinate the selling of that power to the customers and you know manage billing and stuff like that you know how much to compensate the uh, uh, independent solar generator and then how much to charge from the uh, the customers. Um, Nobody seems to want to pay to upgrade the grid. <laughs> right, exactly. So that, that that's where I was going to. I was trying to get to is that like the 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 um the policies have incentivized, you know, the, the, the renewable um generating, you know, uh independent uh project investors to invest in, you know, huge wind farms or huge, you know, utility scale solar farms, but they they don't incentivize necessarily the battery side. Um right. and, and that's 
that's going to take some policy shift in order to, you know, basically like mandate or encourage, um, uh, encourage uh, these independent investors to invest in not only the solar or the wind wind farm, but also invest in the that battery array. Um, and that has to go in to do, in order to do that, we have to incentivize these uh, investors to not only invest in the kilowatt hour, but also in reliability um, and, and other, you know, uh, what's it called? Uh, utility grid um, functions and uh, the values. And um, I went into this in a, a, the, a previous uh, webinar about all those different values of the grid. You know, reliability is just one of them. Resiliency is another uh, mm -hmm. capacity. Um, and so a lot of this is not just reflected in the cost per kilowatt hour. There's a related question in the Q&A about energy storage and batteries that can store a winter's worth of power. And, um, and then there's another question uh, question in the chat so um the winter's worth of power um yes currently there's no electric storage that can store a winter's worth of power um certainly not one that's economic economically feasible uh but one thing that could make sense um is to store a winter's worth of rainwater off your roof and so um what i mean by that is imagine you know we get a especially here in the pacific northwest we get a lot of rain in the winter and so if you get if you install you know five thousand you know around five thousand gallons sometimes you might need even ten thousand gallons of rainwater storage you know bury it in the giant tank in your backyard that thing will get pretty full by springtime and then in the summertime all your air conditioning you reject that heat using a you know air to water heat pump or a water to water heat pump um, and start heating that 5,000 gallons of water uh, with all the air conditioning uh, heat rejection, um, by fall, that water is quite warm and it will stay pretty warm because it's buried below the ground. And then throughout the winter, instead of trying to extract heat out of you know really cold air, uh, you extract the heat from that warm water. Um, that is one way to really reduce your energy usage in the wintertime for heating. And um, in a previous webinar, I talked about just how significant the uh, the, the the pie chart is for um, heating, uh, you know, for for the energy use in winter. And so, if you can really reduce the amount of energy it takes for heating, um, you need a much smaller battery, and um, you need a much smaller solar array in order to be like truly, you know, uh, green energy for every hour of the winter. Mm -hmm. um, so. I mean, that is an idea. And the, the other great thing is like, you know, once you store, they have that, you know, 5,000 gallon water tank buried um, in the summertime, you can use that to, you know, flush your toilets. And, you know, we we're, eventually we, we already have, you know, in the American Southwest for sure, a, a summertime water problem. Mm -hmm. uh, it has not yet really hit the Pacific Northwest because, you know, we're a lot wetter than the American Southwest. But, you know, climate change is affecting our summers too. So like um, mm -hmm. having that, you know, uh, what's it called? Seasonal water storage transfer um, could do double duty as a seasonal energy, uh, thermal energy transfer. So, I mean, that, I, like, I, I like that double duty. So Edward, it's 11 yeah. one, but we have one, one more quick question from sure. the, what percentage of the customer base need to adopt the, DR model to be successful. So that direct utility control model, do you think we need everybody to buy into that? Or if only 50% of people said, yeah, I'm, I'm game, would, would that be enough? Uh, well, that, that, that model, we don't know yet. We don't know that. The reason why we don't know that is because we don't know how many people are going to uh, you know, transition their gas furnace to an electric heat pump. Mm -hmm. um, because, or, or how many people will buy an electric vehicle? Because those loads are the things that will really change what the load shape is. Like, you know, if, um, and, and so if tons of people buy electric, you know, tr uh, transition their heating to heat pumps and tons of people buy electric vehicles, then we will need way more DR de de demand response, uh, as part of that, uh, adoption. 
than if we have a lot of people remain on natural gas and remain using internal combustion uh, you know, vehicles. Uh, so I don't think anybody really knows the answer to that. Um, but for sure, I think like there will be a, peop- a, a certain percentage of people that want the demand response and are amicable to the demand response. But I suspect a lot of people would also be interested in the having home batteries because the home batteries uh, will A, be, you know, you don't need demand response. You're just going to store the excess energy that you generate during the, you know, peak afternoon hours and then use it in the evening. Um, and so therefore, like with batteries, you don't need a very big battery to span from 9 p.m., 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. So like, you know, you don't even need the battery to span all night. You know, if you have a time of use, hey, if you can get the battery to get your solar to power your your house off grid past the nine period period then you're back to seven cents a kilowatt hour and it's like oh great five seven cents a kilowatt hour that's cheap um and so i think a lot of people will adopt a modestly sized battery um and perhaps those people will be not necessarily game for demand response because why do you need demand response when you're off grid you're not buying it any kilowatt hours at 33 cents a kilowatt hour but yet you can still cook you know take showers crank the ac you know and just do that on battery <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes yeah. great so i just want to remind everybody that there will be the recording on the solar organ youtube channel it takes a few days to come up and you'll get an email with the link to that thank you so much edward this is awesome again and we're gonna have another one what's the topic next month oh yes the topic next month is we will talk about inverters and battery choices. As I said, I think that if we really care about that afternoon peak, I think inverters that can talk to, that can connect up with batteries is going to be a very good thing. And I think uh, there's not enough information about you know what inverter to buy, what batteries to buy. Um, you know, and there's a there's huge cost spread in batteries. You can buy, you know, for example, the Tesla Powerwall, which is one of the pre- premium options. And there's much more economical options that are available um, that are safe, that do meet all the safety regulations. Um, and but then, you know, what inverter to buy? And so, like, you know, I think that's what we're going to talk about in the next session is, you know, what inverter and battery choices in order to achieve flexibility, adaptability and economic efficiency. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks, everybody, for coming and hope to see you all and tell your friends. See you next month. Thanks, Edward. All right. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye bye.